I get to introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Eric Rankin. And uh, this is a, a personally exciting opportunity for me to be able to introduce this speaker because he is actually going to discuss today some, some pretty complicated stuff, but it's as simple as complicated gets, if you would. I'm going to read something real quick that he has made a groundbreaking discovery that elementary, elemental geometric forms have a very specific and mathematically perfect musical patterns. So there are a lot of things that we come into context with on a daily basis that we might not know are these absolutely perfect complex systems. And I think that today through Eric's presentation, he's going to be able to present to us something maybe simple or specific that we might not have known is in perfect alignment. And Eric, um, will you take it away, my friend? Sure, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining the Zoom meeting. This is the first time I've actually tried to do the PowerPoint presentation that I give at lectures, like Contact in the Desert or Out at the Integratron. We'll talk about that a little bit. So I'm hoping that I <laughs> push every button correctly. People from the radio show know that buttons are not my thing, running our own board and everything. We have this beautiful uh, radio station in Laguna Beach where I live. So um, I think I'll just get started and we'll, we'll go through there. Does everybody see? <laughs> Here's Morpheus. He, I start every lecture with Morpheus offering us the red pill or the blue pill um, because, and that's come to mean something later, uh, you know, it's kind of fallen down political lines of red state, blue state. But in the movie, The Matrix, I believe that science fiction has actually done a lot to open us up to big concepts from Jules Verne or Arthur C. Clarke, Ray Bradbury, people that had visions of the future that ended up kind of coming true. And the movie, The Matrix, and I'm going to mention some other movies and ideas, but this offering of, of do you want to know what The Matrix is? Now in the movie, it was a construct built by machines who were, were built by some other entity. So it was a micro matrix used to control humanity. And a lot of people might say that we're living in something like that. What we're gonna to address today is the matrix of all creation that physicists talk about. Is there a matrix running behind everything that we would call reality? So I'm just gonna move forward uh, from here. One minute, second. Okay. One of my favorite quotes is from Einstein, which says, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. And a lot of people think, well, Einstein wasn't thinking a whole lot about God later on in his life. He was born Jewish, of course. And, uh, but he actually, there was a, a point to almost all of his research where he had to acknowledge everything he did not know um, to a point where he started studying quarks and protons and realized that a proton, two protons could behave exactly the same way at a distance from each other. And all he ended up calling that was spooky action at a distance. And he realized that there had to be some sort of either an intelligent system at work. He didn't necessarily use the word God later on in his research. And so I, I started imagining that this quote might be coincidence is the intelligent universe's way of communicating with itself. And we become the transducers. We become both the transceivers and the transponders in this feedback loop between the universe because we are a part of its creation. There's no reason to believe, as mo many physicists now believe, that every bit of existence is happening in some sort of feedback loop with a force or an entity or an intelligence that we don't fully understand that we just call universe because that's what we can see and sense with either our own senses or with technical devices. But think of it that this trail of coincidences, as Einstein understood it, could be leading you to something worth studying. Maybe there's a theory at the end of it. Maybe there's a hypothesis at the end of it. And hopefully what I'm going to show you today is the mother of all mysterious coincidental trails. And I've done lots of research. I work with a lot of researchers. And when we talk about what I'm about to present to you, even physicists who don't want to address some of these things that we're going to be talking about kind of shake their head and say, there is something really ridiculously crazy 
about the way this information interlocks. And it right now does not have an explanation that we can ground and say what we would say is fact, but the information is there. And that's what I wanna walk all of you through is this breadcrumb trail of coincidences that hopefully by the end of an hour or so will leave you just in a state of almost awe of what is going on around us and feel like we are truly a part of the grand matrix of all creation. So uh, today the, uh, the raffle prize at the end is a copy of my book. That's what got me in, interested in frequency and ultrasound in sonics in ultrasonics uh, was studying dolphins. I grew up in the, the boat business, and yachting business. I was a Coast Guard li licensed captain for years doing charters and yacht deliveries and instruction. And dolphins started just becoming a part of my routine going out in boats. And I would go to the point where I would jump in the water with dolphins and see behavior that I'd never seen in any wild animal before that they wanted to approach. They instigated almost what you would call gameplay. So I wrote a book factoring a lot of dolphin physiology and capabilities regarding their ultrasound, because if we're talking like Tesla said, if you want to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, vibration. Well, dolphins are Earth's masters. Dolphins and whales are Earth's masters of frequency and vibration. They've been on the planet looking like they look like for about 40 million years, and they, from them, is how we got even the idea of using ultrasound to create image that we images that we could process visually. So the raffle will be a copy of my book at the end. Um, I co-host a podcast called Awakening Code Radio. I invite all of you, if you haven't seen that, to find us. You can just Google search Awakening Code Radio. You can find it on any podcast platform. And we, like Inside Edge, I've been to a few Inside Edge meetings where we just talk about people that would say we're on a path of expanding our consciousness, raising our vibration, learning more about our existence and our true purpose of what are we, what are we really doing here on this planet? So I just invite you to find that. I lead lectures out at the Integratron. Robin and a few other people from Inside Edge have been out there with me. And I've been doing this, my research there now has been almost 10 years, hosting events where people come for a day long workshop has been eight years. And I take six to eight groups a year. I'm the only person they allow in to do this type of research. They actually shut this very popular site uh, down, this building or machine, if you will. And we get to spend a full day talking about all of this information I'm going to share with you. Um, the Integratron is a real mystery. Supposedly, it was built and designed by extraterrestrials, uh, shared with a man named George Van Tassel back in 1953. He built it with the help of Howard Hughes. Uh, when he was working at uh, Hughes Aviation as an aeronautical engineer. And strange things have been happening at the Integratron ever since it was at least partially completed. It was never became a machine of moving parts, but many physicists and research Researchers have gone out there and found all kinds of energetic anomalies happening there. And I took this picture while we were doing a frequency session of these three, you know, orb light craft. I don't know, almost looked like they were creating a <laughs> some sort of passageway or something there, but that's one of my favorite pictures of the Integratron. And where things really got crazy for me, and I'm not going to get totally into how the information came, but it came in a, in a very strange way, almost what some people would call a download. I was sitting in my office. I managed an office building in Fullerton, California, and I was instructed to go draw a triangle on a whiteboard in my office. And I hated math and especially geometry in high school. I never took any math or geometry or algebra classes past high school. And that something even related loosely to geometry would come into my field was kind of odd. But I went, I heard this voice very clearly. I went and drew a, a triangle. And I said, well, I don't know why I did that. And they said, no, now write down it's some total. And I'm like, wow, some total. And I actually did remember from my high school days that a triangle always totals 180 degrees. No matter what the triangle looks like, if it's a right triangle or an equilateral triangle or isosceles, it doesn't matter. 
if you take the sum of its three angles, it will always be 180. Okay, I played the triangle, I mean, I drew the triangle, I wrote down its sum total, and they said, one more thing, now play that as a sound. And I'm like, play that as a sound? You mean like in Hertz cycles? And I'm like, how would I even do that? I mean, if you go back 10 or 15 years, you would have to buy a piece of specific equipment if you wanted to hear individual Hertz cycles that you punched in by their numeric values. But now on our smartphones, there are all kinds of tone generators. You can download one after this show, go to tone generating apps. You can punch in different frequencies and see what they sound like. So I did that and I'll, uh, I'm not gonna play it through my phone, but I'm gonna play you a, a tone through a chime set. So a triangle, if you can hear that, can you hear that, the people I see? Can you hear that tone? Okay. So I'm like, okay, well, a triangle makes a particular tone. And then the floodgates opened. They said, no, we want you to do that with all the geometric shapes, flat, dimensional, sacred geometry. And what blew my mind is it didn't matter what realm I was in, flat geometry of squares and pentagons, hexagons, or solid geometry, or sacred geometry, it made one of these three tones. The sum total would make one of these three tones depending on what shape it was. So it was either this, or this, or this. And I'm a musician, I play piano in a old classic rock band. And right away I realized I was listening to a major chord in music. So this is a major chord. And that's called the most beautiful harmonics that there are in music, the most beautiful triad interval in music. In fact, in music, it's called going home. If you hear a song start in a chord that's not a major chord, there's something within you that yearns to hear that triad. And I'm like, that's really amazing. And then I said, well, what would those notes be? They didn't line up exactly on any keyboard unless I imagined I'd heard about 432 tuning, but it ended up being an F sharp, A sharp, C sharp. And I'm like, well, that's a fascinating thing. And if you happen to look at this screen real quickly, you will see that all the numbers, when you add them up, will total nine. That goes into infinity. It doesn't matter if you were to octave, keep doubling these tones that I just played for you. You could go into infinity and have a number that was a mile long, but you could keep reducing its numbers getting it down to a 2.7 or a 1.8 or a 3.6, and you would get nine again. Here's a partial list of what came through that day was a 14 tone matrix and some numbers in this matrix. Now again, all these numbers total nine, but the numbers that are highlighted in white here started jumping out at me because they were familiar in certain ways. If you look in the upper left corner, you will see 72. I my brain works in mysterious ways. I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but I can remember weird little trivia facts and I'm like really good at Jeopardy. I remember the, the clues and answers given on Jeopardy. And 72 is a number that we'll talk about. 144 is a number that might jump out at some of you or the number sequence 144 with some zeros behind it, 1440 or 144,000. Go down to the E note, 81 and 162 and far right, 2592. Those are very significant. Outside of the realm of math, those are significant numbers. These numbers, these six notes, D, E, F sharp, A, A sharp, and C sharp, were the ones that had the highest degree of what Joseph Campbell would call mathematically mythical numbers. That as Joseph Campbell, the creator of the theory of a hero's journey, told all around the world, of an unlikely hero going on a quest and discovering some important information that he brings back or she brings back to his or her home society, he called mathematical mythology if he, and he kept seeing numbers like this in his research. So let's take a, for instance, here's Joseph Campbell. When I do my slide presentation at the Integratron, I actually have him speaking about mathematical mythologies and the number that he saw most in his studies was the number 432. It was incorporated in myths and religious stories and temple architecture. And all he could do was just wonder, scratch his head. How is it that these different cultures that supposedly were 
impossible to communicate with each other back when they were telling these stories, and yet they all have similar number sequences. Hey, Eric, we got a quick question from John, and he was, okay. um, he was um, interested in knowing where these, neighbor, these numbers came through from the tones, or vice versa. Are you, are you, are you getting to that? Or, or? Okay, so a, 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 pyra a triangle will, its sum total will always total 180, and we can play 180 cycles per second. That's what hertz means. Hertz cycles. So that's 180 vibrations per second. And there's 180 vibration cycles per second. Okay. All right. So let's do a little bit of this mathematical mythology, and I'll share with you a good example of this. I took the number 72, which is the first number on the left of that matrix. Uh, in Judaism, we see the 72 names of God. In ancient Egyptian, Osiris was dismembered into 72 pieces by God's lords of the underworld until he was reassembled. Uh, in, there's certain tellings of the story of Babel in Judeo-Christianity where there were 72 factions or tribes that went out into the planet with different languages. In Hinduism, there's a famous battle between 72 jinns, um, dark force and light force with 72 on each in the Quran, there's 72 mentioned all the time. Most famously that I had ever heard was there's 72 virgins waiting for martyrs who died for the cause. In Buddhism, the biggest, largest Buddhist temple in the world has 72 of these bell-like structures outside of it called stupas. And even in, uh, in Washington, in the state, in the dome, the Capitol dome, there's a painting by an Italian artist, I forget his name, called The Ascension of George Washington. And around George Washington in the middle, you see him, there's 13 angels representing the 13 original colonies, but framing this whole picture full of angels and all kinds of mythical beings are 72 stars. Now, these are cultures at the time that were not communicating with each other so that they would have a significance around the same number is actually staggering. So again, we're following a breadcrumb path of coincidence, and what could these coincidences be guiding us to? That's the quest we're on today, and I think it's the quest modern humans have been on for the past few thousand years. Why a circle has 360 degrees became really important to me because if we're talking about ge geometry, and if we're talking about angles, like this would be 90 degrees, and this would be 45 degrees and straight up and down to be 180 degrees. It's like, that's why those degrees are, is that angle was, had a circle overlaid of it. And how much of that circle did that angle take up? Well, it's dividing 360 degrees. So if it looks like a right angle, that would be one quarter of a circle. So that would be 90. And that's how, how we do it. But the question is, why are there 360 degrees in a circle? Somebody had to have picked that at some point in our history. And I have hosted out at the Integratron these talks and lectures, and I've had mathematicians and architects and people that use geometry in their algorithms and their research all the time. And of course, everyone is familiar with a circle having 360 degrees, but to date, no one has known why there's 360 degrees. And that's part of the big question that we're gonna ask. A circle is 360 degrees because of a math system called sexagesimal math. We are more comfortable with the idea of decibel math because that's base 10 math. Most of the world is now following base 10 math on the metric system. Base 10 math makes sense to us because we have 10 fingers and 10 toes and it's very easy to do math. 10 times 10 is 100. 10 plus five is 15. It's very easy for us to process we're thinking in terms of sixes or sixties. It doesn't seem so organic to us, but hopefully I'm gonna show you that it actually is. But that's why a circle has 360 degrees is it is a function of six triangles with a 360 degree laid over it. And each one of those triangles at its core touching the middle is 60 degrees. So 60 becomes, and that's what sextagesimal means is base 60 math. Now, maybe you've already jumped a, a little bit ahead, 
and imagine some 60s in your life, but we'll go through a few. Why do we measure time by 60? So even though we have to go back in time to find out where a 360 degree circle came from, we are using a lot of sexagesimal math today in our everyday lives. So we measure time by 60, 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes to an hour. If you go around the world and travel in your car, you're very likely to find different measuring systems, meters and miles and kilometers. But if you're a boat captain or a plane pilot, the world is divided into nautical miles and one degree nautical mile is, is 1 60th. 60 degree of latitude or one degree of latitude equals 60 nautical miles or break it down into six nautical mile in increments. So our whole planet, we're measuring time and we're measuring our planet officially by functions of 60. Sacred geometry is des described as a function of circles, but if you really look at it in these little flower petals, look at just pick one of these flower petals for yourself and you will see well, you won't know this, but that arc that makes that flower petal is exactly 60 degrees. That's really important to sacred geometry is that you get that arc correct of 60 degrees of arc. Buckminster Fuller is called one of the greatest researchers and minds of the 20th century. And he said 60 degree math, and he even coined his own term, he called synergetics, reveals nature's behaviors, both physically and metaphysically. And he went on to say, because society does not understand the significance of 60 degree geometry, we may conclude that society does not understand nature. I hope to guide you down a path where you are going to understand and recognize how significant 60 degree is in so much of your life and your surroundings and the nature around you is based on 60 degree math. This is a, a form that Buckminster Fuller did not discover, but he did name the vector equilibrium. And he wrote two huge books about this shape alone uh, called Synergetics 1 and 2. And if you see that white center, it has 12 vectors radiating out of it. They're all exactly the same length and they're all offset exactly the same from each other of 60 degrees. Buckminster Fuller came to believe that this is the matrix of creation, that this is the geometry. If physicists are right in telling us that our universe is geometric in nature somehow, Buckminster Fuller argued that this is that geometry, the vector equilibrium. Now he stayed most commonly in its expression by straight lines, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. So how did we get to the 60. How did humanity arrive at the 60? Well, that became a function of 12. If you take 12 and multiply it five times is how you get 60. And this is a counting system that's still taught in India and other parts of the world to school children. But rather counting just each individual finger, you use one hand and your thumb becomes a pointer and you have the pads or the knuckles of your fourth long finger. So you have on the left, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You have 12 space holders on your long fingers of one hand. Once you reach that 12, you use your other hand, your right hand to hold that position five times. So 12 times one is 12. And then when you get to 12 again on your left hand, you hold up your second finger, 12 plus 12 is 24, 24 plus 12 is 36. 36 plus 12 is 48, and 48 plus 12 is 60. Every 12 that you know of in your life, a dozen eggs, a dozen donuts, 12 hours in a day, 12 saints, 12 disciples, 12 inches to a foot, came from this counting system. And all the 60s that we deal with on our daily basis, geometry of 360 degree circle, measuring time around us globally, measuring our planet the way scientists and boat captains and airplane pilots measure it, that 60 is all based on this counting system. So this becomes a major clue in our path of discovery. How did, where did this counting system come from? Well, we know. We know exactly where it came from and when. So 
archaeological studies reveal that most of life as we know it, if we travel around the world and dig into other than the really mysterious old structures um, like uh, Gobekli Tepe as a temple structure in Turkey that people don't know how it was built, but it looks like it dates to about 12,000 years ago old. So there are anomalies in the story, but for most of the human story, life pre-6,000 years ago looked something like this, a hunter-gatherer existence. People were not farming, they were just going where there was food to eat. They had to go where there was fresh water to drink. They wore animal skins, they had very crude tools. Their shelter was very temporary and something they could transport. This is most life on the planet pre-6,000 years ago. But in one place, in one time on our planet, this showed up, a modern city. This is in Mesopotamia, in Samaria, and you're looking at multi-story buildings. You're looking at the world's first pyramidal structure called the ziggurat, the world's first sailboat, the world's first written language, the world's first wheeled and axled vehicle, loom to weave fabric, pottery wheel, plow, arch, things we use today. And this isn't, we're not talking about tweaking of technology. We're talking about the invention of technology, including the 1260 math system that we use today. So this is an incredible moment in time. Many books have been written about this moment in time in ancient Samaria saying civilization begins here. Modern, the modern human experience with written language, algebra, calculus, physics begins right here in this moment. And we're talking about a blink of an eye moment, archeologically speaking, and we can read their language, it's called cuneiform. There are libraries now that have cuneiform tablets. UCLA has roughly the equivalent of 12,000 of these small like iPad tablets with this language that we broke the code of and can read and, we're, and we can read what they had to say. Where did you come up with all of this technology, language and the math? They said, we did not. We were gifted this information by tall beings who came from the sky, out of vessels that came from the sky. And this is the last thing I was looking for. I have been featured on the Ancient Aliens television program numerous times, and I was a fan of it 12 years ago. Before any of this information came through, I was not looking for, even though I was a fan of it, I was not looking for an ancient alien aspect to this story, and yet here it is. So. Archaeologists want us to believe that these are just formers celebrating the birth of agriculture and they're carrying these little handbags. If you look at the far right guy, the far left guy, they're carrying these little pouches. And we have seen these tall bearded beings holding these pouches at all these crazy sites around the world that confound us as how they were built. And yet we see these types of beings with these little bags. Problem. So we made a video called Sonic Geometry, and if you haven't seen it, I invite you to go and watch that. And we shared all these measuring systems and how we arrived at this information and this correlation. Uh, and rather than having people make fun of us and trolling, we had some really good response from some really high level people, researchers and professors. Um, but they said, you know, the one thing is you're, you're drawing from a bunch of different arbitrary measuring systems. You're choosing to use the royal measurements of inches and feet and yards rather than me metric measurements. You're choosing to you know, measure years in a way or 360 degrees to a circle because somebody said it, a circle should have 360 degrees. And I go, well, that's a good argument. Maybe we can do some research more and prove because the degree of coincidence was so strong I'm like, I'll bet there is something in here that might make all of this research non-arbitrary. So that became almost my, my grail quest as could, is there a way of proving this wasn't arbitrary? So I began to imagine myself as being the interstellar visitor and we're getting, we're, we're not getting close to interstellar visitor, but look at what we've done in just over a hundred years from when the Wright brothers created the first airplane within 70 years, we flew to the moon. 
imagine where we might be if we're around another thousand years or 10,000 years and what we can learn about our planetary neighbors. But we can look at other planets and we can see their orbits and their spin rates and what their atmospheres are made of if they have one. So I imagined I was the sky visitor that the Sumerian people were talking about. And our planet does some very specific things that would be observable from a distance. It has a spin rate, it's very specific. It has an orbit rate, 365 days a year. A day is one spin, 365 of those spins creates an orbit. But our planet does one other thing, it wobbles. And not every hey, does this, yes. Real, real quick, I just want to interrupt before you go into uh, another concept. We had a couple of questions. You said something like, uh, this is a moment in time archaeologically. And uh, the question was, how long is that moment where all these technologies came together? Was it 250 years, 500 years, 1,000 oh, years? Sorry. I th I'm sorry. That was 6,000 years ago, if I did not say it. 6,000 okay. 6, years ago. So about 4,000 BC. BC. Yes, and how long did it take to get to that to call that a moment. How long did it take to develop those technologies? Uh, very brief. That's the, that's the crazy part, is that as far as we can tell, this was almost, now, not overnight, but archaeologically speaking, you're talking about decades, rather, and decades happening in the same place, rather than, oh, we got the wheel from this country, and we got this counting system from over here, and we got this technology from over here, all these technologies were birthed at the same place 6,000 years ago. All right. Okay, one more, one more oh, question. Yeah. Just, I, think, I think this is in regard to the, uh, the structure that you put up there, and it was uh, about the structure in the center. Is it similar to like Egypt hieroglyphics as like a sacred spine or like a chakra to, to, uh, to connect to the, the, the divine? We will revisit it later in the, in the uh, presentation. And Great. Okay. there is actually a, a connection there. So um, as I was imagining self, getting back to this slide, as I was imagining uh, uh, being an extra, uh, extraterrestrial visitor and monitoring all the th mechanical things, these are non-arbitrary things. These are mechanical things that our planet does. Spins at a certain rate, orbits at a certain rate, and wobbles at a certain rate. Well, that wobble is the biggest gear. Imagine all those things as gears. Our Spin rate of a day is a very small gear. Our orbit circling around the sun is a larger gear. But the largest gear on our planet that it does is this wobble. It takes 25,920 years to complete one full wobble. And imagine like a top that is beginning to slow down and instead of being perfectly straight up and down, it starts to wobble a bit. Our Wobble. Now, this wobble is what created a thing called the precession of the equinox, and it's how we get our astrological ages. But that 25920 becomes a very significant number. So let's take that number, 25920. That is a real non arbitrary number. But now let's start using the sky visitor Sumerian math that was taught to us to count on our fingers. 25,920 divided by Sumerian math incredibly equals Sumerian geometry if the circle is 360 degrees. This slide right here is the one that has physicists and mathematicians and professors totally scratching their head because now you're talking about something that while you might still want to argue it as arbitrary, it starts leaning into non-arbitrary because of how well it cross-checks itself. So the non-arbitrary wobble divided by Sumerian math equals Sumerian geometry. The first one, 2160, that's the sum total of a Q. 25920 divided by the second placeholder in your finger is 1080, an octagon. 25920 divided by 36 is 720, that's the sum total of a hexagon. 25920 divided by 48 is 540, the sum total of a pentagon, and then 25,920 divided by 60 is 432, the mysterious number that Joseph Campbell found all over the world in these myth mythologies and temples and religious teachings. This is the mind-blowing slide if you can follow it.
there's other crazy things here. Where did the second come from? How did we get the formula for a second? Well, we take 12 hours of day times 60 seconds times 60 minutes. Look at the number that it produces, 432 with two zeros behind it. 12 hours of night and times 12 hours or times 60 seconds times 60 minutes. Again, 43,200 seconds of night. Total seconds in a day, that was gifted to us, that formula by these Sumerians, 86,400. Well, if we, we use Sumerian miles, remember not metrics, but miles, royal units, our sun is 864,000, the same exact number. If we take 432 and double it, we get 864. Our sun's diameter in miles is a function of 864 with a bunch of zeros behind it, 864,000 miles across. Incredibly, our moon is exactly half of 432, 216 with one zero behind it. The moon's diameter in miles, Sumerian measuring system, is 2,160. This is where it gets really crazy. 432 times itself squared is 186,282 Sumerian miles per Sumerian seconds. The actual speed of light in miles per second is 186,624. That is a, a miscalculation rate almost unnoticeable, 0 0.001. If you square 431, you're nowhere in the neighborhood. If you square 433, you're nowhere in the neighborhood. You square 432 and you are virtually exactly the speed of light according to the measuring systems that were gifted to humanity by so, these so-called sky visitors 6,000 years ago. So the question we start asking ourselves is like, wow, here's a bunch of correlated information, coincidence off the chart. Is there a message that's trying to be conveyed? There absolutely is. We live in a harmonic universe. If geometry is the backbone of this energetic structure of our universe, and as we have found that geometry reveals harmonics, then if we live in a geometric universe, we also live in a harmonic universe. And here's three harmonic triads that are perfect. They all go la, 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 most beautiful forms of music. In fact, you could almost think we have been programmed to recognize these tones played together as a clue that we're receiving information that is correct or makes us feel good. Let's look at nature. Let's look at the geometry of nature. Here's a shell. This pattern is called a Fibonacci spiral. Fibonacci uh, was a man who lived in England, or pardon me, in Italy. He got credited with naming it, although awareness of the Fibonacci sequence in spiral existed before him, it came from Asia. But here's the Fibonacci spiral in small scale. This Fibonacci spiral is expressed all over the place in nature around us. It spins forward, it spins backwards, and then it, if it spins against itself, both forwards and backwards, you create a pattern called the pineal pattern. In pineal, the words pine cone and pineapple and pine tree, and you have a pineal gland, pineal gland in your brain, all has this exact pattern, and that is a Fibonacci spiral going one way against a Fibonacci spiral counter-rotating against it. It is virtually the architecture of most of life as we know of on this planet. Here's the same thing, spiral, our galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy is a Fibonacci spiral rather than very small, very large. So what if we took the mathematics of the Fibonacci spiral and applied frequency to those mathematic numbers? It would be very easy to do. So that reminded me of the movie Close Encounters, that there was a theory that using frequency would be a way for both an extraterrestrial intelligence to reach us and for a way for us to communicate back to an extraterrestrial intelligence. But there's should have been or probably would have been an intelligence or a order or some mathematical algorithm behind the tones that they would use to us and we would use back. Well, let's take a look at these tones that are revealed in this geometric matrix. Let's take the Fibonacci spiral that is all in nature, all the way out to galaxy size, and let's apply numbers to it. 
you start with a number. It doesn't matter what number you start with, but if you start here at the, you see the 144 down in the bottom right, that, that's just picking an arbitrary number. Like that's a signature frequency of a plant. And out of the moment that that plant is birthed out of that right corner of that right hand 144, zero plus 144 is 144 again. 144 plus 144 is 288. 144 plus 288 is 432. 288 plus 432 is 720 and on into infinity. Well, if we play those tones, those mathematical placeholders as frequencies, incredibly, we are right back to numerically perfect harmonics. So now we're really on the path of some incredible discovery about the essence and is there a reason to believe there's a harmonic essence to life on our planet? Absolutely, because we take the first steps of growth of a Fibonacci spiral that launches everything from small spirals to big, the first six steps will reveal that exact same harmonically perfect triad that you have never heard before unless you've somehow engineered chimes or a computer or a keyboard that is not frequencies that humanity ever gets to hear. Well, here's a, um, a document written 6,000 years ago. It's the Sumerian Kings List. So this is written in cuneiform 6,000 years ago. It is writing about these kings, these rulers that lived in the region for tens of thousands of years each before a great flood consumed the planet. What I found inter interesting is the first three kings lived for 288, 360, and 432, with zeros behind it. Literally encoded in this king's list, one of the most famous pieces of cuneiform on our planet that we have ever decoded, and the first three kings, the Holy Trinity, is the same harmonic numbers. And it's a different chord. It's 288, 360, 432, but the same mathematically perfect intervals between them. This is an incredible, another incredible moment of realization of that we have been actually gifted in hard copies, not just in stories, but in hard copies that lasted for 6,000 years, codes and keys that will get us back to these numerically perfect harmonics. So all I could say to that was, what the heck? Let's look at these sky visitors on this mural. This is a mural that has been shaved off of a wall in Sumeria. And it's lucky that it was because um, ISIS uh, bombed out this ancient city of Ur where this mural was uh, excavated. So this is now in a, in a museum in Iraq or, or somewhere. But let's look at it. We've already looked at this slide, but let's look at these, what archeologists tell us are farmers you know, with their little seed bags and standing by a plant, and that's the sun overhead. Let's look at, first, we, the seed bag was a mystery. Let's look at the plant, and on the left side of it, you will see that the man is holding a crank. So this is not a plant that they're standing beside. This is some sort of device that could be actuated, wound up, cranked up somehow, and is doing something. So now we might not be looking at flower petals and branches and twigs. We might be looking at electricity arcing through a tube of some sort. But we can definitely see that it is a machine of some sort because it's being cranked. Up in the upper left of the slide, look at, and the upper right, look at these two guys holding these pine cones, as archaeologists want us to believe. Well, 6,000 years ago, Sumeria was a desert then, as it is now. There was no pine cones. But let's look really close at what he's holding. He's not holding a pine cone. He's holding the same thing that's in the Vatican, right dead center in the middle of the Vatican. Looks like a pine cone. We see this pine cone atop the twin snakes, the caduceus, activating a pine cone. So what is it? That pine cone is our pineal gland. They are holding that pineal gland actually up against the head of the, of the humanoid form in front of them as if this machine is somehow doing something to these pine cones. 
again, giving us a very visual clue of what might be happening. So the supposition is all this information, what could it be leading us to? It, the tone set and this, and this awareness of geometry might be activating our pineal gland that's inside of every brain. Every mammal has a pineal gland. And it could be the basis for instinct in some mammals. It could be the basis for migration in some animals. But in humans, philosophers from Rene Descartes to modern uh, artists like Alex Gray, who painted this, would say, no, the pineal gland is our antenna that is receiving information from the universe as to who and what we really are. And we are just, we've either been ignored it, or ignoring it, or it has been switched off and we are in the process, these last 6,000 years, of trying to switch it on through the codes and the keys and the geometric riddles that were gifted to us. Here's more art by Alex Gray. As if you're awakened, you start seeing the geometry of the universe. You'll see this guy in the far left. He's seeing this geometry. He's seeing that pineal pattern, like the center of a sunflower or a pine cone. What happens when our pineal gland is activated? We become aware, we become conscious. And a symbol of consciousness in many cultures is the lotus flower, another code or clue perhaps. We're familiar with, we've seen the lotus flower as a representation of awakening and enlightenment. Well, here's cymatics. Here's a scientific study of holding in a fluid, or you can even do it with loose grains of sand or powder, apply frequency to it and you will get standing waveforms and then you can take a picture of it and see this incredible geometry behind it. Well, I went to a cymatics lab and I played the three tones of the Sumerian King's List and the frequency tones of sacred geometry. We played both. Look what they revealed. That is a still shot of the patterning that came through when we played the 288, 360, 432. The researchers that had been doing research with cymatics for years had never seen something like this. It is like 3D. It looks like a lotus flower. You can see petals hiding behind other petals deeper you go. They're like, this is incredible. And no one has seen something like this in cymatics research before. So here's another coincidental reason to believe that all of this imagery showing pineal patterning or the lotus flower with these frequency sets that were gifted to us is actually doing something like activating our pineal gland and allowing us to see this lotus of awareness. So my theory became that we might be living in a giant earth-sized escape room. And if you're not familiar with an escape, what an escape room is, it's a form of entertainment. You go to a real location, you get locked into it uh, with either yourself or a team, and clues are inside the escape room, but you don't even know what the clues are. You have to start researching things. So you'll see a clock, you see it says 4438. You might look for those numbers exposed somewhere else, but it's encoded with things that if you figure out all the clues and employ them correctly, solve the puzzles, you get to escape. It's like they were cheat codes provided to you in advance by the builders of the escape room to allow you to up level to the next level. And what I think we could be living in, in what many astrophysicists believe in, we're living in a holographic existence and that we might be, have been getting key, numerical keys and codes and clues, symbolic codes and keys and clues that will allow us to break through to the next level. And I think that there's a possibility that that's what we're doing. And when we arrive together to this next level, we are going to see the geometry all around us. We are going to be consumed and understanding that we're existing in this geometric universe and the payoff, we can't fully suppose or imagine what the payoff might be, but imagine that you are aware of the construct of reality, both in your physiological form, your brain, the nature around you, the energetic patterning of all life in all dimensions, 
if you are suddenly immersed in the awareness of what that is, don't you imagine that that would change the collective experience of us on this planet and our trajectory into the future? I think that this is trying to happen right now at the most critical moment, the escape room moment where it's the best part of the story, like in a hero's journey, it looks like we might not make it. When we are so divided over our philosophies and our beliefs and our safety concerns and our government systems, it all looks like it's fragmenting and fraying at the edges and collapsing. That's at the very moment this information is coming through in so many ways to so many people. I think this is the most exciting time in human history to be on this planet and that the payoff is something that we, living right now, may get to see of what we're doing. And that's the end of <laughs> this, the part of the geometric and the frequency aspect of our reality. Okay, Eric, that is, I mean, that type of information, I'm sure a lot of people haven't been exposed to, that it's that simple yet that complicated. Um, you kind of bring us to a, um, you know, a, a fork in the road because you, you just spent a lot of time um, kind of unfolding, you know, how simple but complex these geometric shapes are using this uh, idea that you've coined uh, sonic geometry. Um, since this is an intense concept that if you haven't gone down that rabbit hole, could you just tell us real quick how it connects to sacred geometry and how all of this, all of this information um, is unfolding in front of us right now and, and how we can move forward with it? Um, do we have time to do that? Uh, you know, we got a few minutes before break, and I, I just, I, I know that this gets a little bit deeper, and if you could just scratch the surface of how it fits. Okay. In. You talked about let's, the Sumerians, let's talk, you talked about the pineal gland. Let's talk about a few things, because this will take us into the most modern research being done in physics right now. And again, it's elegantly simple, and yet probably the most complex thing we could be thinking about, but we could, I'm going to show you potentially what it looks like. That's how simple it might be. So let's talk about geometry. If we're talking about the universe as being a geometric matrix, let's, let's tap into this, this man, Walter Russell, was a contemporary of Nikola Tesla. They were pen pals. They wrote back and forth to each other all the time. Walter Russell grew up in America. He's called America's uh, Renaissance man. And he was an ice skater, he was a sculptor for the White House, he was an artist, he was a dancer, he was a mathematician, he dabbled in physics. And he ended up with this quote, this is probably his most famous quote, is all direction is curved and all motion is spiral, which instantly kind of challenges us because we see straight lines around us all the time. We have another really great thinker of the 20th century, Alan Watts, and he, you could go back and find Alan Watts lectures that he performed in the late 60s and early 70s. And he did one called A Conversation With Myself. And the nature of it was, why does humanity, why are we so fixated on straightness? Why do we want to get things straight between us? Why do we want to iron things out? Why do we want to square things up? There's a reason. It's because it's easier to do. But he said nature doesn't do that. Walter Russell said nature doesn't do that. So here's geometry as 99.999% of people who deal with geometry, and I'm talking at the highest levels. This is the simplest fractal of geometry. It's called a tetrahedron. It is four faces. It has four triangles, three on the top and then one down at the bottom. Well, instantly, if Walter Russell was correct, and if Alan Watts was correct, if nature is wiggly and, and doesn't like straight lines, what's wrong with what we are holding dearest that we call the holy grail of geometry is this form right here. From fractally patterning to how we understand math and algorithms comes from this shape. Well, what's wrong with it? It's straight. The angles are hard angles. The, the surfaces are flat. And I'm going to... Um, to you that there is a true simpler version of geometry and it looks like this and I'm going to come back to a live version and I'm going to show you this is a tetrahedron 
right here. Very easy. This is called the holy grail in geometry because you can't reduce any further from this and still have it holding space. This is holding space inside of it. It's four points, four surfaces, and to be a geometric solid, it has to have surface, it has to have edge, and it has to have points. So you go do some research, you're gonna find physicists and mathematicians talking about the tetrahedron as the simplest containment geometry form there is, but it isn't really. This is the simplest containment form. All you had to do was curve lines. We still have surfaces, but they're curved. You can see that, but it's still a surface. We have edges. There's a hard edge right there. And we have points, but instead of four, we have two. This becomes the true smallest geometric form. And incredibly, if we look at it in 2D, what does it look like? It looks like a petal of the flower of life but it actually is a 3D, 3D structure. Now, why wouldn't we want to study this? Why would we not want to go down the path of really getting in our brains wrapped around what this does? It's because it's way too hard to do. I made a flexi model of it just this morning out of pipe cleaners and styrofoam balls. You could start with this form and go, all right, let's start at a point and let's try and figure out this tangent line. But right away we have a problem because it's curving and it's arcing away from the others. So measuring volume becomes tricky, offset becomes tricky. And then what happens if this thing starts doing this? Breathing or twisting. How do you do the geometry around that? We don't know. That would take a mega computer days just to figure out the probability of what this thing could do before it came back to that. It almost makes time travel possible that if the universe is this geometry, it could loop in on itself and a point could touch a point while this is still inherently there. This is such an amazing form. And I'm gonna go back, well, I'm gonna go back to the share screen and hope that I'm doing it correctly. So here's the flower of life and this, has been haunting us for the human experience about the same amount of time as those other technological advances. The flower of life can be seen all over the world before we thought cultures all over the world were communicating with each other. This is Indonesia. This is Italy. This is Egypt. And this one, this is in the temple of Abydos. This structure, they don't even know how it's on the rock. It is not etched into it. It is not carved into it. It's not a relief. It's not elevated. It's not painted. It's somehow burned almost like molecules with laser-like precision to create this structure and no one knows how it was done and can't duplicate how it was done. This is Japan. This is a food dog protecting sacred information. Look at what it's protecting, a sphere made out of sacred geometry. In Israel, this is a model. Of, this was found on the temple site. And at the very top of this small representation, this is a clue to what the temple might have looked like on the temple mount. And in the very center of it, of this little piece of furniture or altar, is the core of the flower of life. We see it in crop circles often. I got to go to England last year. There was a perfect representation of these, tri these shapes. So let's go back to Buckminster Fuller's model where he said this is the geometry of the universe. He arrived at it by stacking spheres around each other. He took 12 spheres, stat and here's 12 again, becoming very significant, and placed them around one. So up in the upper right, you see 12 spheres around one, and then he took three more on the top and three more on the bottom. That would create your 12. And he called it nature's most efficient bonding system. What he didn't do when he talked about the spheres was overlap them. He just imagined he skinned it with straight lines and that's how he came up with this vector equilibrium model. So you, out of the core, someone was asking about the core, you see these straight lines as if it's energy. Imagine that this is energy now radiating out from some zero point like a big bang phenomenon radiating out equally in all directions 
well, what's the geometry could, that could keep it connected and mimicking itself and doubling itself? It's only this form. But this is the, this is the straight line version of it. What if the interior of those 12 lines radiating out, were instead of just imaginary lines, if they're energy, they have to be frequency lines. They have to be frequency pulses. So what if those frequency pulses look like this? Like the, sh the shape that I showed you. Now we have 12 of these multidimensional petals of the flower of life radiating out from center. But what the beautiful thing is, and that's this structure that it reveals, if we enclose it by the same structure, incredibly, we're hinted at what a molecule looks like or an atom. I mean, that's virtually a carbon atom, right? No, pardon me, a nitrogen atom. Nitrogen is 78% of all material, what we call material in the universe. And that nitrogen atom, the geometry of it, is a vector equilibrium, although curved, lattice. What happens when it overlaps itself? Now this becomes this. And it expands infinitely outward. And every little pinch point, every little point becomes the birth of the exact same structure again over and over, and doubles itself, keeps expanding. You can see right in the very middle, you see that flower structure, and then you see sort of the ice blue version of it, and then you see this purplish version. That's just it expanding out, but there was no straight lines in the structure of it, and yet we can see straight lines. As we start connecting the pinch points, it's very easy to see that there is also straight lines. So. We have geometry here that reveals both curve and straight line, truly becoming the geometry, the holy grail geometry of our potential, our universe. And Leonardo da Vinci, 500 years ago, he even saw this matrix. He drew it in 2D up in the upper right, but right below it, he started his mind, allowed him to see and build in it with dimension. He was using that exact same structure. And then on the left, he built a whole sphere full of these structures, but they're all touching each other and all interlocking and interlacing. So the message is this geometry supports the idea of a connected universe where the smallest thing anywhere you look connects to the largest thing anywhere you look. That is the holy grail of physics right now that we have not solved. We want to believe that we live in a connected universe. This is the geometry that connects it. It happens to look like the flower of life, but you have to get it into dimensional thinking for it to reveal how it could be the geometry that connects all life. Eric, real quick before we cut to break, I, I would like to, uh, we had a conversation the other day about this particular image, but when you showed me of the three tones that you played together over the top of each other, I'm seeing mm -hmm. the same thing. So if you could, just before we uh, cut to break, uh, explain to us how perception uh, or our perceptive abilities as humans um, relates to this, the flower of life. So that's a, that's a great question and it's hugely significant because this is an infinitely expansive matrix of geometry. It starts from the smallest proton of an atom and connects to all the other atoms that can combine to make all the molecules that combine to make everything we know of in our universe, everything from the farthest expansions of our universe back to us into our comprehension of it. But you made a very important part. So the core that holds the balance and connects is that 3D flower of life. Um, I'm pointing now to um, the biggest not the biggest picture, but the biggest picture on the right, where you see the single flower surrounded by a hexagon. But then you, below it, his mind started taking dimension and he went down and he started playing with it. But every one of those forms down below are where Leonardo da Vinci chose to stop. That's his perception. You can see in the far right, it looks like a, a pyramid or a triangle. It's only a triangle because of what he chose to leave off. All it wants to do is keep repeating that flower of life pattern forever. And that flower of life pattern, I guess we could go in there. Here's the logic. If we go from on the upper right, like the one o'clock position, 
the dimensional flower of life petal revealing that, revealing that flower of life explosion. And then we get a, what's called a tube torus down in the bottom. That's the energy that holds everything together. Here's a physicist in my apartment, one of the most renowned physicists in the world coming to my apartment and saying, yes, this reveals a toroidal field because built into it is this curving arc, not only of itself, but outside of itself. And we have that toroidal field of energy. So does the earth, so does our galaxy. The universe is a toroidal field manufacturing system. And that toroidal field, the energy, the geometric energy that holds it together goes back to that multidimensional flower of life. But what makes it look like something versus something else is somebody deciding where to stop. And a great point to bring up is, and you can even look at it and see things. Somebody might look into the whole matrix and go, in it, I can see, like looking at clouds. I can see a horse. I can see a, a plant. I can see this. And yes, it, by what you take out of it, when Michelangelo sculpted, he started with a whole block of marble and said, how did you sculpt it? And he says, I just removed everything that wasn't part of the sculptured form I want to make. That's what we're doing when we're looking at this matrix. It's infinitely there all around us all the time. We're deciding what it is we're making out of it, what we're experiencing. That's, that's a really deep question. <laughs> this is a... Uh... This is the de de decahedron. This one's made out of glass, but it's 12 pentagons. So that's that, that total 6480. And I'm like, and plus it's very shrill to hear 6,480 6, cycles per second is annoying when you listen to it. So I'm like, I'm just going to not even talk about it. But the dodecahedron kept coming into my field and other people talking about it. And it's almost like holy significance to ancient cultures. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know how that fits in. And even the fifth element that we had four elements represented by geometry, earth, air, water, fire, were represented by the four geometric forms that do fit into my matrix. And then there was the fifth element that was the dodecahedron. And that was like to represent the ether or spirit or God. And I'm like, ah, I, I want it to somehow work. So a guy who's been uh, a big fan of my work for a long time. He lives in Ohio or Iowa or someplace. And he just started messing around with the dodecahedron and this high shrill frequency of it. And um, he said, when he turned it on, the first thing he noticed is that it seemed he has ear ring, which some people call tinnitus or tinnitus. And he goes, as soon as I turned that frequency on, it matched what was ringing in my ear, the high shrill ringtone. And I'm like, well, that's unique and significant. And so he did a, his own little case study. He, he's done sacred geometry res research. He had thousands of Facebook friends and fans. He played that tone. He made a YouTube video, played that tone, asked que questions of people. If you have ear ringing, does this tone match it? Incredibly, it was like 75 or 80% of people that have ear ringing. And I have it right now. I seem to have constantly ear ringing we're hearing 6,480. And I'm like, holy moly, that's, that's got to be hugely significant. I went back and started just monkeying around with numbers and, and all of the, the sacred and sonic geometry numbers. And there was the one, incredibly, the one that was the, the factor that made all of this out of the realm of arbitrary into non-arbitrary was the wobble of the earth, the 25,920. Well, if you take that 25,920 and octave it down, meaning divide it by two and two, you get 6,480. So it's crazy that the dodecahedron sum total is a musical tone identical to the wobble of the earth. That is mathematically impossible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that happens, but it, now it brings it all back into the matrix for sure. Okay, this is a really good transition. We had a we had another question, and it's more of just a, a review, real quick. Could you go over the uh, the multiples of twelve, real quick, and how how you you came up with the, the sequential numbering on the pages you showed us earlier? Um, the multiple of twelve, like how how you arrived at twelve, like as a counting system. Yeah, like uh, one of the questions that we had was. Uh, um, let's see, how did you come up with that page of up numbers in the beginning? Are they multiples of 12? So I think she just wanted to kind of go over 
um, how that works and where that fit into the, uh, the geometry aspect of what. Well, everything is a multiple of 12 in this whole entire presentation, including the 6480 we just talked about. You can divide it by 12 and come across uh, even numbers without remainder across the board. So 12 is hugely significant in all of the geometry that we've been talking about, and including even the vector equilibrium model, 12 spokes radiating out from singularity is what launches the, the only geometric matrix that connects itself elegantly to we, what we might call the connected universe. Okay, and real quick, uh, Lisa Brown just asked, is, there, is it possible for there to be tones that play in sequence for like meditative purpose? Yeah, we've, we've done that. If you go to sonicgeometry.com, you will go to our webpage and there's three videos. Each video has about 20 minutes worth of information followed by about 10 minutes worth of sound only. And those sounds are all numerically perfect tones. We don't have like an hour long track of it, but you can hear those tones playing out with no, no voice over them if you want to. Okay, one, one final question I had, as you were going through your presentation, in your opinion, what was the breaking point from when we were hunter and gatherers as uh, to this, this boom of, of Sumerian um, creation? Like what, what, what was the, uh, there was just, you know, we're hunter and gatherers and next thing you know, we have math and canals and ships and multi-level um, structures and now pyramids. What, what was the transition in your opinion? Well, we, we don't know. All we can go back is read the documents. Now, those cuneiform tablets that uh, I was mentioning that are 6,000 years old, we did not know they existed 150 years ago. They were found in an archaeological dig um, in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, and we did not know that we would be able to find a, a language written 6,000 years ago that we would be able to decipher. That took a while. We found something similar to a Rosetta Stone and how we can uh, convert Egyptian into modern language. We did the same thing with cuneiform and we could make, read it as English. Um, that was the moment that they said they went from hunter gatherer to these beings, they called them Anunnaki, from those who came from the sky. And even in the Bible, we have the Anak, we have the Nephilim, we have these tall sky visitors that supposedly mated with the beings that lived on the planet at the time, and we are the hybrid uh, result. Us as humans are a hybrid of actual geo, or not geo, but engineering, bioengineering. Who knows? We, don't have, we can't have proof of that, but the people that created this technology did it suddenly, and the way they said they did it suddenly was being shown how to do it by these sky visitors they called the Anak or the Anunnaki. That, that honestly brings the, I was in the K-Rock the other day, and they, the government has now confirmed that there's 32 different species within the Milky Way, and that there has been contact with alien species, and that we, um, we are currently doing research and, and joint projects with them. That was on K-Rock yesterday. Yeah, yeah. So, this, I stuff, mean, we're, this we're information is, is filtering its way into our collective consciousness, and I think that needs to happen. I actually believe that science fiction often is a transmission of some sort. Um, I often refer to Star Trek. I have a model of the USS Enterprise that sits on my shelf because I happen to think that Star Trek could be one of these or close encounters or contact as it came to Carl Sagan. The, just the idea of how something, or, or even Tesla. Tesla believed in extraterrestrials and he did not, let's talk about Tesla for a second. He did not invent anything the way that what we would call the modern invention process. Um, Thomas Edison, to invent the light bulb, it took him like a thousand tries to create the right vacuum and the right filament and the right amount of electricity that it didn't blow up and didn't just burn out. Tesla created the dynamo the first time. He saw it in his brain first. He said he was telegraphed somehow this image of this working device. He could spin it in his mind, look at every aspect of it. It had to be divisible in its architecture architecture and it's math by three, six, nine, all around getting around these, this structure. This is a structure divided by threes and sixes and plenty of nines, three arcs, you know, I mean, it's, it's all over this. Um, so, I mean, it's not, I think we've been primed for a moment when we actually see something 
verifiable by everyone. I think the human consciousness in a way has been primed by a, a, a process that we can't fully explain, but we would just call imagination or getting ideas about the future and end up creating that future. One of the things uh, Elizabeth wanted to know is if, um, can you talk a little bit about concert pitch and how it's mm -hmm. changed over time and how that, and how the harmonics have been affected? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a quite a story to drop into it and why I don't go in it so deeply because one, it, it almost alludes to something even prior to concert pitch, um, but it includes concert pitch. So I'll, I'll drop into a little bit. All tuning around the world of tuning of instruments, you have to pick a tone to tune around. So somehow that tone became somewhere in the ballpark of um, this. This is an A, right in the middle of our keyboard. It's a very comfortable note to sing around. Pardon me? I think somebody so, came off mute. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so it's easy to sing below it a couple of octaves. It's not too hard to sing above it a couple of octaves. So most musical instruments all over the world are tuned around this tone. Now, why that is, is anybody's guess. Who would have picked that to say, we need to tune off of mathematical principles off of that tone? It seems like even our ancient ancestors recognized that tone as something significant. If you go into the Great Pyramid of Giza, the biggest pyramid of them all, and go into the king's chamber, and you move air around it, like just clap your hands or hit the sarcophagus, it will create that tone. It's like, what the heck is going on with that particular tone? Over the course of modern music, we have tuned our instruments around that tone. And it has been anywhere from 420 cycles per second to 450 cycles per second. Currently, it's 440 cycles per second. If you go and you have an instrument to play in an, inst uh, an orchestra anywhere in the world, that instrument has tuned, been tuned to four, an A vibrating at 440 cycles per second. But that has not always been the case. There was times when it was lower, uh, and there was a, quite a bit of time when it was exactly 432. When we became aware of cycles per second, that we tuned our instruments, to not 440, not 426, not 430, but 432. Well, that 432, as we have seen, is, and it was called concert pitch. And concert pitch was used by many famous composers, Verdi and um, I forget who, the Beatles played a lot of their songs in 432. You can detune your instruments to 432. You're not gonna get to numerically perfect harmonics because that's mathematical. What I exposed to you all today was mathematical harmonics that sound just like you sat at a keyboard and played them, but they're not. They're, math, they're nature's version of a major chord tuned to 432, offshooting off of 432. Now, the crazy thing about that is well, like um, Joseph Campbell realized is that number has been following us throughout history, 432 in all of our cultures, like it's a, oh, look at the cat tail. Um, that it has been following us in our religious stories, in our mythologies, and in our, the architecture of our structures for a reason. It's a code. 432 is significant. We are supposed to hear 432 cycles per second. And remember, the second was gifted to us, to the Sumerians, at the same time as all this other crazy inventive stuff. We couldn't measure a second. We didn't have the technology to measure a second until about 140 years ago. It was Heinrich Hertz who created the machine that could divide a second into small pieces, show wavelength through it, and realize that we can compute a second. That's where it came from. Now, I, there, another reason I don't bring up 432 in concert pitch is there's a lot of people that uh, follow a conspiracy theory around um, getting us off of 432 in concert pitch tuning, like it's so organic and it feels good to our physiology to hear it. Well, yes, that's possibly true. A lot of people that detune to 432, their musical stringed instruments, say it sounds more comforting, it sounds warmer, it's easier to sing to it. Our vocal cords wanna vibrate and resonate with 432 tuning. Here's what I would think. If I were a conspiracy theorist, 
I would not think it was so much about the, the music you were hearing. I would think it was about the information contained in the 432 matrix. And that's all the stuff we talked about today. So if you were Illuminati or you were the Nazis or you were a mystical uh, group that wanted to be the 1% that had the information that was critical to our, excuse me, existence and didn't want the rest of humanity to know it, well, 432 tuning is going to get people talking about the number 432 a lot and understanding correlations to it. If you want to take them off of the correlation process, all you got to do is tune a little bit different. No one's going to know the difference. It's not going to be much different. And yet all that information just vanishes. All that information we talked about today in the 432 matrix just becomes, uh, it just vanishes when, you, when it goes to 440. That's why I think there could have been a, an effort to suppress it is more for the information that it contained about everything than just the hearing. All right, Eric, we got to spitfire a couple more questions before we get okay. to the raffle and, uh, and, and a few announcements. Uh, Sorry, I hope that get... wasn't too long. No, this is excellent. I, you know, what happens is you, you're talking and you're getting people even more interested and we have even more questions. This is the best case scenario. Everybody that didn't make this, uh, this meeting is going to be bummed because there's a lot of valuable information. So real quick, um, did everybody receive this information around the same time? I think that, like in terms of, let me let me get the specific question that says, um, all right, how about specifically what is the influence of the human body on the human body of these particular harmonics? Well, that we're studying that. I mean, the, that research continues to go on. I think that we just look at us now. Look at what we how we perform surgery in a hospital. We use scalpels. We use metal devices. I mean, we have. A, a much cleaner environment, but we're kind of doing the same thing that Civil War surgeons did. We're hacking stuff off the body if it's d diseased or we're covering the symptoms with drugs. But look at what where we're going. The idea of light therapy and sound therapy are, are, are coming into our field and being used all the time. Ultrasound is being used all the time now in medicine. Light therapy is using now laser light to perform all kinds of surgeries. If we had said, gone back 100 years and said, we're going to be doing all these medical procedures with sound and light, that would have been the most ridiculous thing you could talk about. Now we're talking about calibrating sounds or overlaying sounds. That's where harmonics come in. How significant is it to layer in naturally occurring harmonics as revealed by nature's patterning? I would think it would be very significant, but we are just cracking the door open on that process right now. Where do you think it, like the, the ears ringing, you kind of spoke about that earlier, like uh, that would be one of the things that would affect the human body, I would imagine these harmonics. So could you speak a little bit more on, on what you think that might be? That's a, that's a big one. That, that whole ear ringing thing, my ears have rung for years and to know that that tone for most people is 6480 blows my mind. And I wonder, there are people, I'm not going to say I'm one of them, but there are people, because I get to be exposed to all kinds of, you know, conspiracy theories all day long. Um, there are people that believe tinnitus or what we call ear ringing is actually a channel of communication that it is ringing a specific pitch for a specific reason, like tuning an antenna to in your head. Now let's, let's think of it. Let's, let's real quick, maybe the last thing. Your ear is a Fibonacci spiral. It has Fibonacci architecture in it. Your brain, that seat of your soul, that antenna, as it's been imagined by many people, physicists included, is a Fibonacci spiral. What happens if we take Fibonacci harmonics, run them through your Fibonacci ear canal to access your Fibonacci receiver? That makes sense to me. And I think that's very possible. What all this is, is these are clues, these are breadcrumb clues to get us to the point of unlocking whatever this little tiny, it's no bigger than a grain of rice, but you put it under a, man, a magnifying glass and it looks like a pine cone. What is that thing doing dead center in our hemispherical brain? I mean, our brain is designed as two halves. This one little thing is dead center right here where people say the third eye is just further back in our brain. What is it really doing? I think, I think listening to Fibonacci harmonic sequences could serve to help open it up or unlock it or turn on the antenna. 
All right, we have two more questions that I think will tie right into a very good wrap up of, of kind of what you discussed uh, so far. But real quick, I'm going to let Robin uh, chime in and uh, go ahead and get us going on the raffle and um, any um, other announcements that uh, we might need before we wrap the meeting up. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Eric. I, I love having the chimes. Maybe you can tell people uh, how to get these chimes uh, because this, you can't get them just anywhere. Like you say, this isn't the normal tuning of instruments. So Great. how do you um, put this to your life? You, you know? know, Michelle, Michelle is the one that, the, how the chimes even came to be is a funny story. Michelle was gifted to them by a, a manufacturing, a chime manufacturer in Australia. And when she showed them to me, she said, look, and she played them and they had numbers on the sides of the chimes. And I go, those are sonic geometry numbers. And she goes, oh, you and your dumb sonic geometry video. You know, she didn't say dumb, but she goes, we'll call the manufacturer. The manufacturer picks up the phone. We do a conference call. And I said, I'm really intrigued. How did you come up with the number sequences for your chime set? And he goes, oh, there's this amazing video you got to watch called Sonic Geometry. I and <laughs> he, this manufacturer had no idea that he was sending him to a person who knows is a best friend of mine. But, I mean, the coincidences and synchronicities in this whole story are off the chart. Uh, Eric, man, you blew our minds today. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for all of your time and effort. And um, uh, just a couple questions to close. We had a question about the number 1111 and how that is significant. And then also that uh, this was Patty's, I think, that the mind, the body, and the spirit is a trinity, is a, is, is, a, um, is, a, is, a, is a numerical three. So could you end real quick just by wrapping it up with uh, kind of letting us know what the significance maybe of 1111 is and how all of this wraps together in the mind, body, spirit situation? Well, 1111 11 is big for me. Um, a lot of people have all kinds of theories about what seeing it is. It is a true double blind phenomenon because people all over the world have seen 1111 on a digital clock and been triggered to thinking that something significant is trying to get their attention. What that means, we don't really know, but that there are so many people, millions of people over the world who have not been suggested and apply the same kind of meeting to this time prompt makes it a phenomenon just for that purpose alone. I've been seeing it since 1982 and it is a big part of my book, The Aquarians is the 1111 phenomenon told in a fictionalized story. Um, can't go much further than that. What was the other one? The, oh, the Trinity. I think the idea of a holy trinity is really important to sonics because you have to have a trinity to create that major chord. You have to have the first, the third, and the fifth. So I, I think the holy trinity might have always been trying to wrap our minds around the harmonic essence of nature as revealed in the geometry, but it's all about the three. Well, glad we could catch up to you, Eric, because honestly, like, it seems like it's been 6,000 years since people have been able to catch up to this geometry anyway, so. We're all catching up together. I've seen lots of other people adding to this, to this bed of information that interlocks with it, so I'm excited. Well, you gave us a lot to think about, and listen, thank you for your time, thank you for your passion and dedication towards uh, sharing this with the world, and I know, I know we talked about it before that it's more of like a purpose and a, and, a, and a divine path. So please keep following it. And, and you are our leader and we are following you. Thank you very much. I don't want to be a leader. I don't want anybody to follow, but we're all in this together. Fair enough. <laughs> everybody take yourself off mute. Say goodbye. Thank you, Eric. Everybody clap. Thank Say, you, everybody. Hey, Eric.